listening to the Finding Careers End podcast. I'm your host, Pete Newsom, and my guest today is Caroline Gerhardt. Caroline is a multimedia journalist with WTVY in Dothan, Alabama, and I'm really happy to have her on today because she's someone I've wanted to interview for a long time because I've known Caroline through her parents for a number of years, and so this is sort of a unique opportunity. Caroline, how are you today? I'm doing good. How are you, Pete? I am doing great. Thank you so much for taking your time. And then, and I know it's your day off. So of all, of all things, you could be out doing anything fun, but here, here you are speaking with me. It's my pleasure. I've been excited about this for a while, so I'm ready. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to connect. First, let, let's just start at the beginning, Caroline. You're a multimedia journalist. What does that mean? So a multimedia journalist is just a fancy word for reporter, right? I mean, Things have changed over time and we kind of call it a one man band now. So when I wake up in the morning, I pitch stories. I go out and with my camera, my tripod, my audio equipment, everything, I do all the footage. I do all the interviews. I take all of that back. I edit it all. And then I also write the web stories for it. So any story that I have a part of, I've pretty much written and produced everything that goes into it. So they call it multimedia journalist just to give us a little bit more credit, I think, than just reporter. I think that's the appropriate phrase, given that you have to do all of that stuff. I mean, that that is, I think most people probably don't realize when they see a reporter on TV, they're doing all of those things behind the scenes. So unless you happen to be out somewhere and you see someone setting up their own camera, but even then you don't you don't realize all the work that goes in ahead of time. So you really, you really are multimedia. You're doing it all. Right. And it's funny too, you know, in, in Southern Alabama, very, you know, Southern hospitality kind of culture, lots of Southern gentlemen. I always have, you know, men who I'm interviewing wanting to carry my camera equipment and stuff for me, trying to help me out. And of course I'm like, no, please don't touch my equipment. You know, people are really sweet trying to help us out, but it is a lot when you pack it all into one day. Well, let, let's go, let's talk about, I mean, the fact that you're, you're really young doing this too. And, and that is something that um, I, I want to explore. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on, because you are, you just graduated, you graduated from Troy. So let's go backwards to go forwards. Talk, you're a recent graduate of Troy University. Talk about um, a little bit on how you ended up at Troy in the first place, because you're an Orlando girl, which is how I, how I, you know, know your, your family, of course, and know you. Yeah, so I um, I was actually, I, I mean, I still am a dancer, but I grew up dancing competitively from age three, and I dance has always been a passion of mine, and I knew I wanted to explore it in college. Um, I was originally planning to go to a school in Oklahoma for that, but I thought about it, and I said, you know, I really want to pursue journalism as well. It's always been, I've kind of always had these two passions of wanting to be on camera and writing and then dance. And the only school, one of the only schools in the country that would let me double major and do both of those specific majors was Troy University here in Alabama. And I visited the school, fell in love with it. Everybody was kind of like, we've never heard of Troy. What, what is this place? But um, it was the perfect place for me. I just adored it there. And so for four years, I pursued, I took dance classes, ballet and contemporary um, four days a week. And then when I wasn't in the studio rehearsing for shows and dancing, I was in journalism classes and I was a part of our um, student run um, broadcast news program, which is called Trojan Vision. And I got to report for them and anchor for them. So I packed a lot into four years, but yeah, I just, um, I interned with WTDY before I was um, offered my full-time position this past summer. As soon as I graduated in July, they decided they'd keep me. So I, I am like three months on the job just now. <laughs> so, so that's this is a lot. I mean, you you blew through that uh, explanation <laughs> as if it's no big deal. But I want to explore it a, a little further because it's a really big yeah. deal. You you were in a sorority in college. You mm -hmm. went to dance, with, which is its own full time job by by any any rational definition, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you had super high expectations on you for that and time commitment. And then somehow along the way, you, you were able to do, you know, be a reporter in, in college, have an internship that ultimately has, has led to the job. So talk about the dance commitment for a minute. You, you, I know this is something you've done, you said it, since you were three years old. What yeah. was a, you know, a, a week like or a day like uh, on average while you were in school? Yeah, so like I mentioned, we would take ballet for an hour and a half and then contemporary for an hour and a half, 
Monday through Thursday. And during the fall semester, we would prep for our fall dance show and spring for our spring dance show. Um, fall was a student choreographed production. So I choreographed my junior and senior year um, in addition to also being in pieces. So a typical week, I would go to class in the morning for three hours, um, more like four actually, because we would have an hour and a half break um, or half an hour break, excuse me. I would go to my journalism classes for two to three hours, depending on what day it was, run home and eat something, and then either be back in the studio for rehearsals or be in the theater for dress rehearsals. Or if it was a day that I didn't have studio rehearsals or anything like that, like you mentioned, I was in a sorority. And so I would like to, you know, get involved in different things my sorority was doing and go to events with my friends and stuff. So there was never a dull moment. That's for sure. It, it was a huge time commitment. It's not for everybody. I loved it because I loved what I was doing and the people I was doing it with. Um, that really made all the difference for me. But it was a great way to stay in shape. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, I, I was I, always moving. <laughs> not not uh, not getting a lot of sleep along the way. I, I would right. guess. Yeah. So you said it's not for everyone, and and I think that's correct. But I think everyone would want to have that sort of passion that they're able to pursue. And, and in your case, more than one thing, uh, which is rare. I, I, I'm sure you realize that that. Um, most young people and, and college students don't don't have that um, thing yet that they found that they're willing to commit to and and do it not because they have to but because they want to and that's a real gift in in all of this. So let's now then go back even further because I want to understand you know where did that come from? Do you, do you know, when did you first? You said you started dancing at three, but as you were in high school, considering what was what you're going to do next. We, how, how soon did you remember that you said, this is really what I want to do and, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to pursue it? Yeah, I, I remember I went to St. Mary Magdalene in Orlando, K through eight. And I remember eighth grade sitting in our computer lab talking about careers as just, it was just the topic of our discussion that day. And I started looking up dance as a major in college because up until that point, I didn't really know that that was a possibility. Um, and I, I found that school in Oklahoma that I mentioned earlier and I was like, oh, that's where I'm going to go to college. I'm going to be a dancer. That was it really. Um, I wish it was like a little bit more, you know, exciting than that, but it really, you know, I think it's something that performers only really understand the feeling that you get when you're on stage. It's indescribable. And once I experienced it, at three years old, I was like, this is it for me, you know? Um, but it's interesting because I get that feeling when I'm on air too. I mean, it's that same kind of, you know, butterflies in an anxious way, but then when you get into it, it's just so rewarding. Um, but yeah, that, that really like eighth grade was when I was like, this is what I wanna do in college and then for my career. Um, and then as I started to teach dance as well to kids and you know other people in my studio, that really um, transformed it for me too because I, I love teaching and choreographing as well. And you've never wavered from that. Was there ever a time along the way where you thought, oh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I'm getting burned out. Maybe I'll do something uh, different. June, sophomore, junior year of college, I, I got really sick one of my semesters of soft, um, sophomore year. I actually had to come home for a little while, get better, and then go back. And at that point, I was like, should I really keep doing this? Like, my body is kind of rejecting it. I'm putting a lot on myself. And then I got back and I was like, I missed it all so much when I had to take a step back that I was like, no, this is what I meant to do. You, you know, you can't really... Um force those things. I don't think, right. right? It, you know, it's either, it's you either have it or, or you don't. And I try to tell young, young people, including my own children that, you know, find that thing that you think about when you wake up in the morning, that you go to bed thinking about that you would do under any circumstances if you didn't have to. But I've also realized that's so much easier said than done. So when I said a few minutes ago, it's a gift, I really do look at it that way as I've explored this topic a whole lot more with Zen gig and, and doing the podcast of trying to understand how to give the best advice to others of how you can find your, what we call career Zen, but that thing that, that you really would do because you want to, um, 
do you have any sense for where that comes from? I mean, I know your dad pretty well, who is <laughs> yeah. a, is slightly competitive, we'll say, right? We were just friends a little for, bit, just a little number bit. Of years. We, we work <laughs> together now and he played two sports in college, which is in and of itself is extremely rare, ever, you know, needless to say. Do you think, it, and I don't know your mom as well, but do you, you think it came from them or, or just do you think it was just who you are um, as an individual? It's funny when my parents talk about like, you know, this kind of crazy path that I chose, they're like, we don't know where she came from, which for my dad is ironic because he played two sports in college and everything. So I'm like, you know, that doesn't really add up, but um, <laughs> we think we may have an idea of where it came right, from. Right. Right. But I, I mean, I think part of it really was, is just a part of who I am. You know, I, I was blessed with two parents who always just said, do your best. You know, it wasn't, you have to get straight A's every single year from three to 18. They said, do you want, do you still want to dance? Is this still what you want to do? Even in college, every year they asked me, do you still want to do this double major? Is it what you want to do? You know? And so I think who I am inherently combined with, you know, that positive reinforcement and that idea that it is up to me and it's my choice really was like, the perfect balance to get me to where I am today, because I, I can only imagine that if it had gone another way and there was this high expectation set for me that I might not have been, you know, as keen to reach it, I guess. But I've always just been a really self, you know, motivated person. I was always the one freaking out at 10 years old that I didn't study enough for a test or something like that, you know? So um, I think a lot of it is just inherently who I am, but I, it definitely has been a gift, you know, having these two passions that I love and that I knew I wanted to pursue, but it also has been a curse at times just because it's always what I knew I wanted to do. And so it felt like, oh, well, there's no other options. Like, is this all I'm ever going to do? Am I good enough to only do this? You know, am I able to do anything else? So I think it definitely is a double-edged sword at times, but I'm so grateful now being in the position that I am having, you know, a profession in this, that, um, that I, that I had those two things, you know? Yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, it's, it's a, it's a really good thing and an enviable thing because, um, there's people who spend their whole life searching for something that gets them excited, something that, you know, uh, causes them to, um, to really work hard. And, and that's a meaningful thing to me because I think success can't happen. Doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by coincidence. And so if you need to, you need to put your effort into it, you need to put time and energy into it, but to do that towards something that, you're not excited about is, is a terrible thought. And so it's advice that I give to young people as often as possible. Sometimes I ask their parents to, to cover their ears when giving it, but th to say, don't go just get a job. Yeah, that, that sounds like an awful thing to tell a young person, go find something and take as long as you need to, to find that spark, that thing that, that's it for you, what, whatever that means to you as an individual. But, but the missing piece is how, right? How do you find that? So I think you're right in, in large part that it's who you are. C certainly you had the right support structure in place and the right environment to set you to up for success, but it was, it had to come from you, right? It, and, and, and it is all about you ultimately. So um, do you, do you have any advice and in, in, in it's okay if you don't, because I, I don't uh, on, on someone who's young and trying to figure out what to do, whether they're in high school um, or, or getting out of school, who, who is lost? What, what uh, do you have any thoughts on, on what you would recommend? I would say take every opportunity that is given to you. Like, I just feel like in primary education, K through eight and high school and secondary education right now, educators are finding all of these innovative ways to, you know, offer career paths to their students. And I think that there, there's just a multitude of opportunities available and you're not gonna know unless you try. I, I like, I didn't start Trojan Vision in college until my junior year. And I might not have ended up pursuing this if I hadn't you know, really learned how to report and really learned how to sit at a news desk. And I decided to jump and take that opportunity and that's what led me here. So I think 
trying new things and getting out there and stepping outside of your comfort zone, you might not realize that, you know, the thing that you were meant to do is something that you never thought you would do before, if that makes sense. It makes complete sense. I'm glad you said it because it's, I think it's great advice and it is easier said than done. You know, Mm -hmm. if you, you have to have the personality uh, to do that, you have to have the confidence to do that, to, to try new things because that uncertainty is, is scary, right? It, it, you know, fear, fear of failure, fear, fear of, um, of, of feeling awkward or or embarrassed or uncomfortable. You, you have to go through, you have to get on the other side of that somehow. And that's, like I said, it's much easier said than done, but it's important and it's necessary to some degree. Yeah. That, that fear of the unknown, I think with my generation in particular is really a big boundary that we have to get over, you know, I, I like to stay in my comfort zone and it sometimes it takes me a little extra push to get outside of it. So um, I think especially with young people nowadays, it's um, we like to, you know, be on our phones and stay in our little box and not go out of it. And, you know, you never know what will happen if you do take that step out. So what, what do you think about that? I, I think I think about phones often and I think that you know, with a lot of tech, as, as with it, a lot of technology, there's so much good that's come from it, but so much harm as well. And and phones in particular, uh, and and I'm guilty of this too. I, I spend way too much time looking at looking at mine. It, it's always with me. But I'm, you know, I, I, I I'm a I, I've already done a lot of things. I've already achieved a lot. I've my world is 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 not. Um, there's more of it behind me probably. <laughs> unfortunately, than there is ahead to some degree. And so I think often that if I had a phone, um, then in constant entertainment, I don't remember what boredom feels like. And um, I remember that I was bored in college. I remember that I was bored when I was um, broke and and didn't have the means to do to do much. And I remembered that I didn't want to feel that way. And so I had to go achieve. I had to work. I had to find a way to um, get past that. Now, no one's bored. No one has, you never have to be bored. You have the encyclopedia of the history of the world at your fingertips, unlimited games, unlimited exposure to whatever topic you want. And so I worry that, you know, where does that motivation and drive come from? So what, what, what bothers you about the phones? I mean, that's, that's what bothers me is that I think it's just, it's, it's taken away drive and motivation from, from a lot of people, a lot of young people in particular. Absolutely. I, I feel the same exact way. And it's so interesting. This job in particular has transformed the way that I look at my phone because I only really used my phone, you know, to communicate with my friends and play games and use social media and everything. And I am on my phone 24 seven now, but calling contacts and, you know, getting emails and stuff. And so when I get home, I don't want to touch it. I'm like, get it away from me. I want to sit down and like be a person for a minute, you know? Um, but in college, I, I was attached to it in all those ways. It was a way to know, you know, when I had a free minute, not be bored and freshman year, I lived by myself. And that really was like, I was able to just like escape into it to a not healthy degree, you know? Um, I really think it's changed the way that we communicate with each other, not for the better. I feel that so many of this cancel culture that we have in today's society and, you know, people getting into fights and stuff, so much of it stems from the fact that you can't interpret tone and intention through a text message or a tweet or Facebook post, you know, you have to be able to communicate with a person face to face to do that. And as somebody who communicates for a living, I think that that's the like worst part about it right now is that I see, you know, we take a lot of social things from social media and they can be stories sometimes. And it's like, well, this might not have even happened if you guys had just picked up the phone and called each other or, you know, met in person and talked about it, you know, so. Yeah, and there's constant opportunity to to do that, and and yeah. too much opportunity where it it never stops, and it's it's as easy as sending a you know a one sentence message, which can and and often does ruin relationships and and change the entire course of a relationship that 
would you'd have to go out of your way to make contact with someone prior to those social media. You'd have to make a conscious decision. I'm going to pick up the phone. I'm going to call this person. Right. I'm going to have a conversation with them. There's going to be back and forth interaction live where mm-hmm. now it's, it's, you know, you don't know what you're going to see next, depending on your mood and, and your situation that you're in, in the moment. I mean, I've probably done it too. I, I, I know on Twitter o- over time, I mean, I've had to change the way I use my Twitter account where I, I would get in the habit of sending a reply or message to someone without any thought until I, I you know, t- a little time went by and I thought, wait a minute, this is, this is a terrible idea. Right, <laughs> this right. is not a, this is not a good, because it, yeah, once you send that message, it, the world owns it. it. It never goes away as you well know. Yeah. And that does a lot of harm a- along the way. And we keep going back to the younger generation because look at my age, if I do it, now, so be it, right? I, I can live with the consequences, but a 15-year-old, an 18-year-old who um, still has to rely on on so many others who are going to potentially see those messages can be devastating, uh, which is, which is you could argue, is unfair, but it's fair or not. It's the world that we're in right now. Absolutely. And I think, too, you know, thinking about TikTok and YouTube, these video, like, heavy platforms... I think it can expose people to so much more in not a good way that they should be. And also I, I see so many people who are, you know, looking for a career, not sure what they want to do and just decide, Oh, well, I'm just going to make it as an influencer. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's like a one in a million chance that that's actually going to be sustainable for your lifetime, you know? And That I think is a huge thing that people ask me when I said, you know, I want to be a journalist. They were like, oh, are you going to do like TikTok and YouTube as like, you know, a supplement? (laughs) I was like, no. I mean, we do, we have to keep up with our social media, Instagram, Twitter and stuff because people use them as forms of news, um, news media. And so that I, you know, I try and keep up with, but the other things I'm like, it's funny that because people so because so many people get their news through those apps that they automatically, they sync us up with each other, even though that's not necessarily what we do. Well, it's blended now, right? I mean, for better or worse, it is, it has blended. You, you of course are not uh, unaware. I I would suspect Well, I say, of course, I I don't really know this, that the media's reputation over over the last couple of years is, is in question at times. And, and um, while, you know, I, I, it's funny. I, I will often think we, you know, we used to take things for granted, right? We'd hear, you know, Walter Conkrite, uh, Conkrite, right? Is that how that would be pronounced? Yeah. Okay. So, or, or <laughs> yeah. you know, people like that who were just those, that was the authority. They would say it. You, it. Maybe people questioned it, but I think for the most part, you just assumed that what you heard on the news was fact and we went forward and that was okay. Now, every statement has almost what appears to be a polar opposite contradiction that's made and um in the world it, it, we're, we're all over the place with this conversation so hopefully you don't mind but but, but no it's great but, but, this is how my brain works so i'm i'm diving with it <laughs> but but today i mean what's your take on all of that where you know i'll use the easy example you turn on msnbc you get one story you turn on fox news you get a complete right. contradictory message and you know journalism seems to be a lot more about sharing of opinions and in having an agenda today, it seems to me as, a, as an outsider than it used to be. Is that is that accurate or would you disagree with that? Um, from a journalist standpoint, that's not accurate. Like the idea of as a journalist, I'm unbiased in every story that I do, you know. Um, but as journalists, our goal is to share others' opinions with the community. So it's also really different on a local market like I'm in. Um when I first started publishing my stories and getting them aired and everything during my internship there, I can't even remember what the story was about, but it was what we call a soft story. You know, it was something sweet that happened in the community. I was all excited. I got to meet new people. I was so excited for it to go out. And when we posted the web article on Facebook, somebody commented something nasty, like nitpicking (laughs) at a certain thing. And, you know, I like to think that the world is rainbows and sunshine sometimes. So it's partly part, partly my issue, but also like, I just had to, I've had to come to understand that somebody's always going to have something negative to say about what you do. And 
my job is just to say as unbiased as I possibly can um, throughout that. And, you know, it's interesting. We, in our newsroom, we talk about and look at, you know, national news all the time. We were um, CBS and ABC affiliate. And so, or excuse me, CBS and NBC, goodness. Um, so we'll pull national stories sometimes. And it's interesting to see the difference in how they produce their stories versus we do just because I would say now more than ever, they're trying to be as careful as they possibly can with their wording and what sound bites they use in a story so that they're not creating that polarization between audiences. Because the goal is everybody wants, you know, we want everybody to watch our newscast of course. and so not everybody else's. And so the goal is to never be biased, but like I said earlier, share other people's opinions. There's a rule for, uh, about subjective versus objective sound bites. Um, in journalism, you never want to use an interview, a clip of an interview where somebody's just stating facts. You want to hear the emotional side of what they have to give. And, you know, that's like if a sheriff is giving a press conference about a tragic event of a murder or something, you don't want to give the body was found at this time in this place on this day. You want to put in the story, our heart is going out to these families and what this tragedy that they've gone through, we are going to find whoever did this, if that makes sense. Yeah, is, so, that, is that because people connect with emotions? Yeah. Okay. And our job too is to do the boring part, is to say, you know, sometimes the hard part, sometimes the boring part, but just the facts. And um, and then we let, you know, the people tell their stories. Because as you, I'm sure you know, human beings are natural storytellers. And so we just kind of try to play into that emotion of, you know, let's get you the facts that you need to know, but also you really want to hear the story, what these people have to say about the situation. You don't want to hear that from us. So that's kind of where that idea comes from. Yeah. Well, my, my unsolicited wish for, for journalism as a whole is that it, 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 really does find a way to to be balanced going forward and to be more objective than than anything else and um because i think we need that i, I think i think the polarization of um you know of the country right now is and this is a bigger issue than we're going to solve by the way but uh is is bad for everyone so i understand it uh from a business standpoint why you'd want to say extreme things to get clicks and and you know, pander to your audience if 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 you're if you're on one side or the other, but I think everyone loses. <laughs> Absolutely. No, and I think that, you know, there's a difference between pushing like pushing somebody's buttons too hard in an interview. Like I'm gonna say this to you to get you to say what I want you to say and just kind of letting them tell their story. Um and I think people have taken it to that extreme of let's push this person to their furthest point and, you know, see what happens from there. And that's not, that's not what I ever want to do. You know, people, especially in this area, freak out when I bring my camera around in the first place. So I want to make them feel the most comfortable that they can. Um, but yeah, news can't media can be very polarizing right now. And, you know, I think part of that comes from, also, you know, in a live interview, you never know what that person's going to say. And so much of what we do is live broadcasting. Um, and so I think we can get into trouble there sometimes too. So speaking of live broadcasting and, and being out in public, uh, there, there's a trend. Uh, it's an unfortunate one where, where you know, people like to jump in and, and try to get on camera. Is that something you've, you've encountered yet and had to deal with where you're like, Come um, on, get, get out of my <laughs> shot? I did. So um, our station does a series called hometown tours. And so that happened during my internship. So we would pick a new town each week of July and on, and we would do stories on little cool things in that town, a cool museum, a cool, you know, factory that's there. And then um, on Friday, we would do our live broadcast from that town. And so the first Friday that it happened was my first live shot ever in history, which like no pressure or anything, right? Um, but there was a woman who had some very specific things that she wanted to say. Um, and thank goodness we were not live yet. We, they just had the cameras set up and everything. And I was just kind of prepping, but she, you know, was hooting and hollering and, you know, kind of screaming about what she wanted to scream about. And our chief engineer who is, the best kind of walked up to her and was like, 
you know, we need you to leave. And she started yelling at him. Thank goodness. She just kind of went away on her own before the live shot started. But it was that situation was a little bit more like scary and anxiety inducing than like, oh, my gosh, you know, get away. But um, thank goodness I haven't had any crazy people try to get into the back of stories or anything yet, but it happens more often than people think. A lot of it doesn't end up on TV because people don't want to go, at least as journalists, we don't necessarily want to go viral for that because it kind of demeans some of the work, I think, in a way. Absolutely. But um, but yeah, it's it's crazy. Even just carrying a camera into like, you know, parking in a shopping center and wherever I'm taking the camera, people just screaming, put me on TV. I'm like, well, are you doing anything interesting? If you are, then maybe I will. But if you're just grocery shopping, then I'm so sorry. I'm not going to, you know, so. Well, maybe be fun. careful what you wish for when you say that. <laughs> right. They may, they right. may you know, show you do something interesting on the fly that you'd prefer they did. Right. Oh, goodness. Yeah, we wouldn't want that. No, well, but I, it I, is, yeah. Yeah, my message to anyone who's who likes to jump in front of a camera, or you know, it, it happens a lot at at, um, at athletic events where the commentators are are talking, and someone realizes they're in the shot. No one wants to see you, and whatever you're doing, you're gonna. It doesn't look good. No matter you may think it does, it's a bad idea. So yeah. there, mm -hmm. I I support that not happening. A hundred percent. Right. So yeah. so let's talk about becoming a journalist because that that's something that um. It, I, I suspect a lot of people want to do. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, you, you want to be on TV, you want to be, you know, famous, right. You want to be known, you want to be recognized. I mean, you, you mentioned earlier the feeling of being on stage and I, yeah. I get that. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of live performances and I'm constantly amazed by the the talent at level of someone had, you know, being able to go out on stage night after night, perform at a high level and then the appreciation that comes has to feel amazing, right? Yeah, so does that, does that ever get old? That doesn't get old ever. It's funny though. I want to go back to what you're saying about people wanting to do this. It, we're at like a low right now of people joining this career, at least in oh. my area. Yeah. Um, I know my program at Troy, you know, they're always looking for new talent, new people, um, we at WTBY are always looking for new talent and new people. And I think part of it is what we were talking about. You know, the media does have kind of a negative connotation to it right now. And I think a lot of people are scared to say that that's what they want to do and, um, pursue it, but that feeling never gets old. It's like, once, once people do get into it though, it's like, you see all of this beauty in it and, you know, it is really rewarding getting to, you know, just like that feeling is on stage. My goal was always as a performer and a dancer, I at least want to make one person in the audience feel one emotion, depending on whatever kind of piece I was doing. If I was doing a musical theater tap piece, I wanted to make somebody smile and laugh. If I was doing like a sad or contemporary piece, I want somebody to feel the emotion that I'm feeling as this character. And so from the journalistic side of things, it's more that I want to, give somebody information that they didn't have before that might change the course of what they're doing tomorrow. Or, you know, even if I, if it's not my job, it's the meteorologist's job, but even if we can get somebody to take their umbrella tomorrow because it's going to rain, you know, that changed somebody in, sure. you know, so that's kind of how I look at it. And that really does never get old, especially to, you know, it doesn't happen a lot, but when people kind of recognize me, if I'm like, you know, doing whatever around town and they say, oh, I really liked this one story you did or something like that. It's, it's an awesome feeling. I, I bet I, I, it has yeah. to be, I, but I, yeah. I'm surprised that, um, so the, you know, back to the the part about the media being criticized lately, you know, I think of that first at a, at a national level, right? right? I, I don't associate that locally at all. And I, and I only associate it with really politics, I guess, from, from yeah. you know, is what I think. So, you know, that, that seems pretty isolated, but do you think that that's a reason that, that people see, I would think almost the opposite, not, not having any real clue that people would say, I'm going to go make a difference in this. And if that, if that, you know, perspective ex exists today, right. You know, whether it's valid or not, I'm going to be different. I'm going to change it. I mean, I, I I'm surprised it is it, that, that there's not a, uh, a line out the door of people you know, wanting to be on camera. Right. And I mean, that's my mindset too. And that's kind of how I've always been the person 
where like, if something's not the way that I think it should be, I'm going to try and be a part of the change and help, you know, facilitate that. But I think also a big part of it is the majority, not necessarily the majority, but a lot of people who go into school for journalism want to do sports. They want to be on ESPN. They want to be, you know, sports center, all that. That's what they want to do. And it's a really hard, it's a niche position. There's only one to two sports directors and reporters at each station, even in big places, you know? So um, I think that's also part of the reason why we're not seeing, at least I'm not seeing or hearing of a ton of new people wanting to be a part of this. But um, then the other issue is too, that the few people who do usually end up really good at it and everybody's fighting over them. So sure. it really, sure. yeah, so it really is, um, because unfortunately that is a hard thing about this job. You know, you can be really passionate about journalism and you can be a great writer, but you might not be able to handle the on-air personality type part of it. You know, you might have the personality to do it, but you might not be able to read as fast as you need to read or, you know, pronounce all the words correctly and things like that. I was blessed that I don't have a thick Southern accent. So I don't, I didn't have to do any like dialect co coaching or anything like that. But I know, especially in the South, there are people who struggle with that. Um, so I think there also are a lot of, there's a lot of self doubt in people who might consider it and end up, you know, not pursuing it. Well, I think that's, uh, has to be a big piece of it. Is it, um, you know, there's a, like a big intimidation factor is how I would yeah. think of it that um, you, you, you probably don't think, you know, a lot of people wouldn't think they're, they're qualified or, or good enough to make it and yeah. incorrectly assume. I mean, I really am surprised that um, you're not describing it as, as even more comp competitive just to just you know, break into the industry because um, I, I know people want to be on camera. I mean, it's, right. and, and maybe they don't realize that, um, that that possibility exists or back to what we talked about earlier, maybe that fear is, is, is preventing. So if someone does want to pursue it, where, where, what would you recommend? I mean, where, where do you start? Do you have to get a specific degree? Do you have to have an internship? Where, where, what's the path? It's interesting. I don't necessarily think you need a journalism degree to, to do this job. Now, some places are different. Some places might require you to have one. Um, I think anything in English communications, like really does that. You definitely do need a college degree. Um, but from that point on, you know, start really starting out in the business. It's kind of, my dad always says to his players, you know, why would you go to a D one school where you're never going to get on the field? You're going to sit on the bench the whole time. You should go to a D three school where you're actually going to get to play. If that's what you want to do. Sure. I'm starting out in a super, super small market. I looked in Orlando. I like, I really wanted to go back home. I'm really close to my parents and I, I looked in Orlando and there was just no opportunities there for me at the moment. So I talked to my director at Trojan Vision and he set me up here in Dothan and it is a super small market, but you stay for two years and you get all of this awesome on-air experience and then other people you know, they want you. And I think that is a really um, hard thing too, that people don't understand is that you're not going to get a job at NBC right out the gate. Like, it's just not going to happen. You know, you have to have those experiences in smaller markets moving forward. So that's my biggest advice. Again, great, great advice for, for, for younger people who need to hear it. And um, that's, that's been, you know, a generational problem in, in my experience where I, I would say, you know, people it generally under 30 right now think that success happens. You know, this is a, a very much a generalization, but the, right. a, a, a too big of a percentage, I'll say, um, think that success happens quickly and it happens easily where I, I don't, know how to be successful quickly. And I even mentioned that to in the office the other day to our team. I said, think about anyone who you know who's achieved something significant, someone you know personally, someone you, you who's famous that you look up to. And then think about which of those achievements came fast and, and came easily. And I, I don't know of any. I don't know of anything that's significant that happens easy. And so you do need to put in that time. You do need to climb the mountain. And that's how I think of it. But yeah. um, 
So, but, but, you know, so many people just want to show up at, at the top, right? Like you mm -hmm. said, show up on it, Absolutely. you know, NBC nightly news from day one. No, yeah. No, right. And happen. I mean, like, I feel like a part of me was still like, oh, maybe I'll get an offer from, I don't know, you know, and it really is. It's just not feasible, but it's interesting when I did one of my first interviews for my internship, um, my news director I asked me, you know, who are some of your favorite journalists? And I'm a huge Today Show fan. Like I grew up watching the Today Show with my mom. Like that's part of the reason why I fell in love with journalism. And I love Savannah and Hoda. And so okay. when I mentioned that, he was like, oh, Hoda, you know, interviewed in this market, in this area when she was first starting out, out of college. And so it's like, you look at that and on the Today Show, they'll show, you know, their old stories from when they were reporters out at a storm, you know, just getting footage and stuff. And so I think that it, it is important to remember that everybody came from somewhere and more often than not, the people who really had to work hard for it are still successful in it. It wasn't just like a one hit wonder tech deal. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. I think those things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I interviewed Brian Shields, who is uh, oh. a meteorologist here in Orlando uh, mm -hmm. a, a couple of weeks ago. And he uh, talked about how, you know, he about his path and how he would drive all night uh, in college to, to get a shift um, you know, on air out of state. And then even after he graduated, he, he had a weekend opportunity in a bigger market. So he was flying back and forth to um, another another state again there. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it was so, it was so nice to hear because when you go industry by industry and job by job, everyone I speak with without exception, who has achieved any level of success has a story like that. Um, and I, I just think those stories need to be shared. I think that message needs, needs to be shared. Um, and, uh, and so it's great to see you, you doing this. It's great to see that you, you know, weren't waiting to be handed anything. You, you've, you've taken your career, uh, you know, the bull by the horn, so to speak, right? You're, yeah. you're right out of school. You're, you're going on air. What, what's been the hardest part of, of that for you and that transition from student to professional who's, you know, you're accountable now, right? People are listening to you tell them yeah. what the news is. That's a big deal. It is. Um, and it's funny because I, I graduated July 29th. I think it was a Friday and I started work that Monday. So I did like, I didn't take any kind of break. I, I just went right into it. And I think the hardest part was kind of internally, like making that transition from student to professional and also trying to, you know, prove to myself that I am a professional. I'm qualified to do this. I definitely battle imposter syndrome. Um, through, like, and that's a lot of because of just the situation that I was in, you know, moving from student to professional so quickly. But um, from an actual on the job, you know, what has been really hard is that throughout, you know, my entire life, I've loved to write. And I've always learned super long form, you know, essays, research papers. I like to be wordy in my writing and that's just not broadcast writing. You have to be short, you have to be to the point, you can't use too big words, you know, and every once in a while I'll turn in a script for approval and my news director will call me in and be like, and just point to a word. And it'll be like, I don't know, something like loquacious or something. I don't know, I just picked a random <laughs> don't, yeah, don't but I was use like, that on air. <laughs> There, he was like, really? It's like, I know, I'm sorry. So that has been a really hard thing to battle. It's definitely, I mean, even more than a habit at this point, you know, that type of writing for me. And so breaking out of that and learning how to just be super quick, super conversational and, um, and make sure that it's not too above anybody's head is, has been tough. Well, I, it's interesting you mentioned imposter syndrome. I'm, I'm familiar with that feeling when I was um, first out of school and I would, I was in recruiting and I, I remember talking to people who were older than my parents and I was, I would have to talk to them about their income and their, their career. And it was so uncomfortable until I realized, wait, I'm the professional here. I'm the one whose job is to do this. And, and it's only uncomfortable if I make it that way or it, mm -hmm. and, and, I had to make that switch. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and, and it wasn't yesterday. It was a long time ago. And I, and, and it, I think 
you know, young people who you know are can be held back by by that, um, and and you're not doing that. So, what advice I mean, would you give to to young people who may who may feel that way that they're not worthy, so to speak? Any any um, anything you'd share on that? Um, I'm definitely still working on it. So, any advice? I'm also trying to kind of take myself. Um, I think it's funny. Fake it till you make it is is a good thing to think about because even though you might think. I'm not good enough to do this. Well, just fake like you are until you can do it. And I, I find that mostly in similar situations to you. I'm talking to somebody about, you know, a tragedy that maybe has happened or something that's really important to them, a charity that they need donations for. I, I did a story this week about domestic violence awareness. And sometimes I'm, I'm a very girly girl. I like to wear pink. I like to, you know, dress the way I like to dress and people might see me walk up and be like, oh, she's not a serious journalist. She, you know, is this little girl, you know, walking up out of nowhere. We don't know her. And I have just, you know, decided that I'm going to let my work speak for itself. You know, I'm going to ask them the questions I need to know the answers to. And through that, they should be able to understand that I'm qualified to do this. And, you know, I know what I'm doing kind of deal. Well, you're doing it, right? So I think that speaks for itself. But but you didn't um, bring up something that you know, I have to say, I, I often don't think about in, in in interviews or even business settings where, which is gender. Um, mm-hmm. You know, t- to me, it's it's never in my career been something that that I've thought of. And, and so you could say to that, well, that's because you're a guy. <laughs> you haven't had to think of that. How, yeah. how much does that come? I mean, d- d- is that a factor for you too? Is it, you know, do you do you see that as a you know as a as a woman and in particular a young woman that you have to uh, operate at an even higher standard, um, you know, than than you otherwise would have to if you were older or or if you were a man or is that is that something? Hopefully, you you don't have to feel. Yeah, I mean, I, I love where I work and we have such a supportive, you know, team and administrative team. And I have never felt that way, you know, through through my work ever. Um, I think some of our viewers sometimes think that, you know, we have to perform to maybe a higher standard and that's just self personal bias um, from person to person. I do think that women in general in media, in journalism, struggle with the idea that, you know, based on how somebody looks, somebody might not be willing to listen to you, do an interview with you, or even believe what you're telling them on television, um, which is we, we're making strides, I think. I think news and media and journalism is coming becoming more body positive and um, more accepting of, you know, all races, genders, religions. Um, but I, I, I'm in Southern Alabama and, you know, sometimes there, it's just not like that here. Um, I find myself really worried about how I'm looking when I, when I am on air and, you know, that's also just me. I really care about my appearance, but I know that there are people who maybe if I've put on a few pounds, they might comment, Oh, is she pregnant? We have had people come up, not to me, thank goodness. Cause I don't know if I would recover, but, um, we had somebody come up and like ask if somebody was pregnant and it was like, are you serious? Like also that's what you're focusing on when you're watching the news, you're not focusing on the news. So it's just, um, I think that's the hardest part about being a woman in this industry. And, you know, I think that there has also been a connotation of, you know, well, I guess I kind of touched on that, but like, there always has to be a male and a female anchor. Mm. And why I love the Today Show so much is because they broke that, you know, after the whole scandal that they had happened. And um, I think that that was kind of the first step signifying to everybody else that like, we can we can do this all together. You know, we can start to battle these kind of stereotypes. Yeah, I look, I look forward to a day where we stop focusing on all of that so much. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, I, I, I feel like we could be close. I feel like we keep getting pulled backwards to some degree. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. you know, there's the, the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, football coach is, is a black guy. And he was asked a question about coaching and, you know, another black head coach the other day. And he's like, what he, he, he I love the way he answered the question because he basically said, well, you, like, <laughs> that's the last thing on our mind. 
Right. Like we're exactly. football coaches. Why would we, why would that be a factor? Um, and, and he essentially said, you guys stop asking about it. It'll stop being a factor. Right. And, and that, that I believe and um, but, but we all know it's still real selectively and, and in some, in some cases, some parts of the country more, more than others, um, some markets more than others. So um, good for you for identifying it and, and, and not letting it slow you down anyway, because that's really what ultimately is necessary, right. Is to uh, face right. those challenges and then, and then move forward what you're doing. So um, good for you. Thanks. Especially I think in that case too, I feel I'm like my dad, very competitive. And I'm like, well, if I act like that, then they win. So I'm not going to let them win, you know? So I'm just going to keep doing what I do and being myself. And that's all I can really do. <laughs> well, you know what? I think that's a perfect way to end then Caroline. And except I do have one more, qu one question. I ask everyone this and in, in, in when I'm talking about uh, their career and, and what they've chosen to do, although you're still on your way. So I will ask you anyway, have you found career Zen? Um, I would personally say not yet. I think I'm still so new to this three months on the job with what I do. It's difficult because it's so easy to take it home. Um, news is everywhere. News is happening all the time. So I don't know if I found it yet, but I'm definitely in the right place to find it soon. I'll say that. That's a perfect answer. I love it. All right. Yeah. Well, Caroline Gerhardt, thank you so much for your time today. I will absolutely check in with back with you later. I'll get you, you know, to come on. We'll see what you're doing next. We're going to follow your career and uh, just really appreciate your time today. This has been really a pleasure. Of course. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be on. Of course. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Drive safe.